The title of the message this morning is Jesus and Politics. Woo! Brave man is right. There's a combination of people who um, right now are stoked about this. Some of you all that are a little bit weary about this. Uh, You know, this is one of these messages where um, I wrestled with it. I feel like it's almost every single Sunday, but I really, like, I just felt like the Lord really wanted us to always be looking at the Bible and applying it to culture, and then you get to moments like this, and you're like, oh, no, the Bible and culture and all of it, what do you, let's just let the Bible speak for itself. Um, So let me give three things uh, before we uh, dive into the message. Um, It's just kind of three points. These are just um, some some personal opinion things before we dive into the meat of the message. Uh, First thing is, I just want to encourage you to go vote. I mean, it's, there, there are people that have paid a tremendous price just to give you the freedom to be able to voice your vote. If you've ever complained about politics, which is probably uh, about 100% of us, if you've ever complained, you cannot complain unless you cast your vote. I'm just going to say that right there. So uh, if you're like us, my wife and I, we got our vote taken care of last week. Uh, you might have to wait an hour, two hours, three hours. I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's worth it to be able to flex your right and cast your vote. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing. Uh, This morning, we're not going to get into issues. And everybody went, oh, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Like, I'd love to talk about the Bible's view on abortion right now. Oh, man, we could go for it. I'd love to talk about the Bible's view on how we handle refugees. I'd love to talk about the Bible's view on how we love our neighbor. I would love to talk about the Bible's view on a lot of things, but this morning I'm not going to hit on issues um, because here's what we're so guilty of. This is the third thing. We have a collection of fingers and thumbs that we are have been given, most of us, and we take these fingers and we tend to point things out all the time, and I'm all for pointing things out, but sometimes it's important for us to be less about fingers and more about thumbs and point towards ourselves and say, how do we respond to moments in culture in reverence to the Scripture? So... This message is not for your neighbor. This message is for you. Although if you are watching online, share that so your neighbor can see it because it might help them out. Uh, So so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go through seven questions and try to do this in a reasonable amount of time. Seven questions, 10 minutes each, 70 minutes. Just kidding. Um, uh, Some of you are like, we got lunch plans. Uh, I want to go through seven questions that I've been kind of asking myself. Uh, during this uh, election period. I mean, the next 72 hours are going to be wild. It is going to be a wild 72 hours. And then you got people like me that are responsible for me, and I got to figure out how to check my emotions and thoughts and opinions in all of this. And you got to do the same. And hopefully this will serve as a a kind of a guide for you. Uh, And so if you really want to apply this, I mean, most weeks it's good to take notes, especially today. Jot down some of these questions. Jot down some of these scriptures. Not that any of you are with a pen. You you could type like this, I guess. But write them down. And then on Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, bring them back up and give yourself a little bit of a check. Because some of these are going to be harder to grasp than you may think at face value. Um, Would you do me a favor? Pray for me as I uh, get ready to share this word right now. Um, We're just going to pray right now. Jesus, let these be your words, not my words. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, first question. Is God attached to a political party? Well, I mean, in fact, if we're going to go for it, let's just go for it, right? Like, no, like, skirting around it. I would say absolutely. 100% God is attached to a political party. Some of you are like, oh, no, I didn't sign up for this kind of church. Where are we going? Let's let the Bible speak for itself, okay? Book of John, chapter 18. We have a political moment that's going on right now. And I'm not going to like take a scripture verse and be like, Jesus rode in on a donkey, therefore he's a Democrat. I'm not going to do that. I've seen people do that kind of stuff. I'm not talking that. I want to take a look at how Jesus worked and navigated through politics because he did. Jesus had this habit of being around the poor and the wealthy. Jesus had this habit about being a part of people who were of every walk of life. And hello, that includes politicians. And so we're going to see in John chapter 18, he is with one of the top politicians in that time frame. It's a guy named Pilate, and it says this in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you king of the Jews? Man, you want to talk about a political question right there? He didn't just call Jesus up 
He said, Jesus, are you somebody who is declaring their office in society? This would be like if one of you guys decided that you were going to be president and got hundreds if not thousands of people following you and you were interviewed on TV asking if you were the president of the United States. I mean, this is a radical question he's asking them. He is asking, are you king of the Jews? Imagine how he answers this could have massive political ramifications to it. So if you think politics aren't in the Bible, this verse right here, it's present. And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Side note, form your opinions based on what you think, not on what others think. Woo, verse 35, and Pilate answered, am I a Jew, your own nation, and the chief priests have delivered you over to me? What have you done? And Jesus answers this question. This is the political party that Jesus is affiliated with. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. You know what Jesus would be about? Jesus would be about the agenda of heaven every single time. Because some people, they, they, they put all of their trust in a political party. And what happens is every single four years, you're like, oh no, who's my new king right now? Man, aren't you glad that your king wasn't voted into office? Because if you can't vote him into office, that means you can't take him into office. He is the king of the Jews. He's the king of my heart. He's the king of this church. Jesus has always been and always will be king. So if there is a political affiliation to say, yes, Jesus is absolutely at the top office. And it's way outside of this left or right argument that so much of the church is having. I mean, you want to go ahead and split the church right now? Start picking sides on the things of this world. But Jesus had this awesome ability to want to supersede this and say, no, the agenda of heaven is exponentially more important than the agenda of the left or the right. And so it's underneath this assumption right here that Jesus is king of the world. Do you all believe Jesus is king of the world? Come on, I just want to make sure. Do you believe he's king of heaven? Do you believe that he's always been king? He always will be king? Like this, we got to really understand this. If we're going to go through any of these other questions, we have to establish that he always has been and always will be king. So this brings me to my second question. Is God going to be surprised about the outcome of this election? Because I know I, I might be surprised. Like I have my opinions. You probably have your opinions. They might be the same. They might be different. It's okay. We can still get along. We can still be friends. We can still love each other. It's amazing how there's grace no matter what side of the street you're on with that. that we, we can actually love people. Well, I might be surprised the Lord himself, and this is more rhetorical right now. I know you guys are getting this. Don't worry, I'll step on your toes in a minute. God is not going to be surprised on the outcome of this election. If you look at the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 21, it says he changes times and seasons. He's responsible for everything that happens in Virginia with our bipolar weather patterns. It is underneath the lordship of Jesus. We, uh, um, Erica's parents have a pool, and I feel like we're always covering it, uncovering it, covering it, uncovering it, because that's what you do in Virginia. The time and the seasons are under his control. He removes kings. Some of y'all are like, man, if we could just remove this king right now. He sets up kings. Some of you are going, man, if we could just set up the same king right now. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. This whole election is underneath the authority of Jesus. It really, really, it does not catch him by surprise in any manner. And it's so easy, I'm so guilty of this sometimes, of falling into the trap of putting my trust in something other than the Lord. And that's kind of like the third thing right now, and this is where we're going to start getting a little bit more uh, nitty-gritty, is, is, your, is your trust in the Lord or is your trust in a political system? Because if your trust is in a political system, you're going to find yourself in a faith crisis or a personality crisis or an issue crisis every couple of years. But if your trust is in the Lord, it's going to be something completely different. It says this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, a verse that a lot of us are familiar with. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. When we are looking at how this is going to un un unravel over the next couple of hours, 
we need to understand that it's not based on my understanding or your understanding of it. It is based on the fact that the Lord has all of these things under control. He really, really does, and I don't have to fully get it. All I'm responsible for is acknowledging, and then he will make my path straight. It says in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 2, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. <sighs> That's easier said than lived out. But if we're going to take the Bible for what it's worth, if we're going to look at this book and we're going to say, these are, these are actually the things that are present right here where it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. If I'm going to follow the teachings of Jesus, I have to acknowledge that God is doing something in this and that my responsibility is simply to fall underneath the leadership that God has already put in place. And oftentimes, the church falls short of that. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So some of these things are, are, are kind of no-brainers. Hopefully, if you've been walking with Jesus for any period of time, like you know that God is the ruler of everything. You know that there is no, like, God's not just a Democrat or God's not just a Republican, that there is freedom for us to disagree on certain issues, that there is, there is liberty found in the gospel, that we know that Jesus has everything under control. But let's get a little bit more practical with this. Because we're responsible as humans in this year to live out our faith in this season. God could have put us at any point, but he chose for us to be existing right now in 2020 and navigating through the election. And so... I have an identity question for you. Is your identity found as being a follower of Christ or in a political system? Because if some of y'all, whoo, I take a look at your Facebook feed. I don't know why y'all are laughing. <laughs> you look at certain people, you're like, man, what are they for? Are they for the things of the gospel or are they for the things of whatever that particular issue is. And we can get so passionate about things other than Jesus. Imagine what would happen if the church was just as passionate about Jesus as it is about political issues. Woo, we would see a revival take place in our land. But we get obsessed with these things that are secondary to the lordship of Christ. Like when you became a believer, I don't know what year that was. I don't know what took place when you became a believer. But when you had that moment where you surrendered your life to Jesus, where you said, I'm no longer going to follow over my own passions. I'm going to follow after Christ. The old has gone. The new has come, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. When you became that new creation, all of a sudden, that becomes your title. That becomes who you are. And those are the things you should live for, is getting the name of Jesus out there rather than a political issue. And when we have that mindset, when we go, okay, Jesus is fully in control of everything, and now we also submit ourselves saying we're a new creation that goes after that, now we can live out this thing called the gospel. I don't know if it's just you guys, I'm feeling hot right now. Woo! John chapter 13, verse 35. We're going to get very practical. It's stuck to my arms. I'm sweating so much. John chapter 13, verse 35. It says this, by, all, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. Why? If you have love for one another. Are you living your life out in a way where you are loving people or are you just trying to flex your political view? Because we're called to be people that if we agree with them, we love them. If we disagree with them, we love them. If they're part of the same political party, we love them. If we're part of a different political party, we love them. I heard two times this morning, on two different occasions, two different people that are in this room right here, right now, that they've witnessed something in the past week or two where different political party people feel like they cannot even get along with each other. Where they were going to go over to somebody's house, but they saw a sign in the front yard, and because there was a sign in the front yard, they couldn't love them. This is how divisive this can be when we choose to uh, honor and submit to a political system over honoring and loving one another like Christ has called us to do. We are supposed to be people that love everyone. And that is 
easy to preach, hard to live out. And so question six, this is the one, if any of you all are Facebook happy, that um, you might need to check yourself with. Are you a peacemaker or a quarrel starter? God calls us not to be peacekeepers. Peacekeepers are the ones who take things and kind of sweep them under the rug, right? We're called to be peacemakers, people that stand up for injustice, people that stand up for things. We take action. We're not about just keeping the peace. We want to actually make peace. But are you a peacemaker or are you somebody that's just starting quarrels? Uh, there's a, a book in the New Testament called the book of Titus. And in Titus chapter 3, it says this, and this is gold right here. It says, but avoid foolish controversies genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And this is what we need to find ourselves finding, under, uh, submitting underneath going, we're not going to be people that are about that. We're going to be people that are about something that's far greater than that, a passion that's far better than that. We're going to look at the book of Romans chapter 12. And we're going to see where it says, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, not your neighbor, not your brother, not the person you don't like, but as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on me, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. You guys know I have a, a whole collection of kids. I feel like we have a new kid every couple weeks. And um, you all laugh because you know it's true. And uh, so I, we have three of them are girls. And one of the things that happens on a regular basis, I'm just going to call them girl number one and girl number two because I don't want to have any of my daughters have PTS from being a preacher's kid? So daughter number one frequently has things taken from her by daughter number two. And all I hear is, give it back! Like it comes from any room in my house. It's like this constant like on record play that takes place. And daughter number one has this habit of picking up objects and wanting to strike daughter number two to get item back to herself. I don't know what side of Erica's family that came from. Ho! Oh. I'm always in trouble. <laughs> Probably came from my side of the family. And, and, and what takes place sometimes is she tries to get it for herself. And I've told her several times, just come to me, let dad take care of it. Come to me, let dad take care of it. I promise you, child who's below the age of 30 and does not have the reasoning that your father does, I can handle this right now. And so what's great is when they listen. Oh, that's the greatest parenting moment right there. When a child listens to you, you're like, Thank you. There's a God. I just, I love it. So when the child listens to me, he says, you know, um, uh, my sister took this from me. I'm like, okay, you stay right here. I'm going to go take care of it. And the best part about this is, this, this is all this child does. They just sit and wait. They have no idea that over here, I am handling things in my fatherly way, making sure that vengeance is taken care of, getting the item back. All she has to do is sit down and wait for her father to do something. And there have been times where she chases after dad, and now I'm in this really tough spot where I can't do what I was going to do because there was interference right here. But... When she stays the course, it's amazing what the father is capable of doing. And when it comes to these different issues, these different things, we sometimes, when I say we, I'm talking to myself right now, I will do this. It says, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. My job is not to navigate and figure out every issue. My job is not to solve every single problem that's based here on the earth. My job is to submit myself to the teaching of the Lord, and if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And watch Dad do what only Dad can do. That's good preaching right there. Woo! To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Next time you disagree with somebody, invite him over for dinner. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Don't give him that nasty Dr. Perky knockoff soda. Make him a good glass of sweet tea in Jesus' name. For by doing so, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is our role as believers. If we want to see how Jesus meshes with politics, it is a matter of letting God be God and us submit ourselves to him. 
So the question for you is, are you more of a peacemaker or are you a quarrel starter? If you're having trouble, just scroll through your feed. You'll see yourself. The last one, and this is the one that I, I, I find the hardest to implement, honestly. Are you genuinely praying for our authorities? Because we know this, right? Like we know this verse from Timothy where it says, First of all, I urge you that supplications, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. If you look in the Greek, what is all? All means Man, you all are so smart. I'm so thankful to have a congregation like this. Thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those who are in high positions. All people means kings. All people means presidents. All people means senators. All people means mayors. All people means local representatives. All people means your boss that you don't like very much. All people means your boss that you do like very much. We're talking about all people right now. First of all, then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires for all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. What if you had a passion to pray for every single person of political influence that they would have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? What if you spent less time arguing an issue and more time praying for their soul? This sounds like gospel work right here. What if you were so passionate for people that their political affiliation didn't create a barrier to get in the way? That you were about people, because guess what Jesus was about? He was about People, it didn't matter what they looked like, who they voted for. Jesus wanted to see the lost come to him. He wanted everybody to be saved. So that candidate that you are frustrated beyond belief with, Jesus went to the cross for them. That person that you're thinking, man, how could a person even have such evil policies in their mind? Jesus went to the cross for them. He he, he did. That's what the gospel looks like, whoever should come. And what we do is we make politics this God, and therefore we make the gospel not approachable to it. And I would say we need to get a correct view and realize that politics, while it's important, please understand, cast your vote. That's the first thing I said. But recognize that as important as that is in our life, it's not very important at all in respect to the gospel. So rather than just preaching about it this morning, we got about 72 hours, a little less. Somebody smarter than me can do the math. What is it, 11? That's too much for me right now. (laughs) Let's stop just talking about praying. Why don't we pray for our country right now? Because this is what's going to happen. Wednesday morning, who are we kidding? It's not going to be decided by Wednesday. At some point, (laughs) at some point, there's going to be somebody who's chosen as the winner of this election. Hopefully it's done by Wednesday morning. And there's going to be a group of people They're going, finally, it's about time. And they're going to have their hope placed in something that's going to fail them. There's going to be other people where their world comes crashing down. And it's because they put their hope in something they never should have put their hope in. And I'm so thankful that Jesus, when when he got up to Pilate, he said, I am king, but not of this world. It's something greater than any of this stuff that I can put my trust in. And I want us to pray that that as as a congregation, we would really rally behind that personally. Again, this is your this is your study sheet, this is your test for Wednesday. That you would go, okay, I'm in line with these items. That you would pray for your neighbor, you would pray for the we would just be people that pray. That that passage that's quoted so often from the Old Testament where it says, if my people would humble themselves and pray, I would heal their land. We're praying that we would be humbled and we would be worked on. And so I want to invite the the worship team back up. And we're going to take just a a few minutes right now. And I just want us to to pray. First off, just starting with with you and wherever you're at in this faith journey. You know, perhaps you're, you're in a moment where you have put your faith in so many things and been let down so many times and you need something solid to stand on. If that's you, I know somebody. His name is Jesus. He's always been sufficient. His grace has always been enough. 
My sin has never been too much of a burden for him to carry. He is greater than anything this week could throw at him. And if you need something to, to, to put your life behind, I'm telling you, Jesus is the thing to do. So maybe for you it's a matter of just humbling yourself before Jesus. Maybe you've spent a little bit too much time scrolling and getting a warped view. How about where it says in Romans, therefore be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you would focus on the things of God and your mind would be transformed and you would see freedom in that. Maybe you need to pray for your kids or that, that parent or an aunt or uncle, neighbor. Why don't we just take a moment just stand to our feet and turn this room for a couple of minutes into a, a spot where we could just pray and believe God for even greater things done internally. So I want to ask if you take maybe 30 seconds right now and just pray for your heart in this entire thing.